This is uh, potential failure modes and semi-quantitative risk analysis uh, presentation going over chapters A3 and A4. Some of the uh, objectives and key concepts. For the objectives, we want to identify and describe failure modes, understand what information is needed to develop failure modes, understand how a potential failure modes analysis a PFMA is accomplished, understand how to screen failure modes and prepare for risk analysis, learn the most common failure mechanisms, and learn how to identify and describe more and less likely factors. That's for Chapter A3 potential failure modes, and for Chapter A4 semi-quantitative risk analysis, SQRA, the objective is to understand how to complete a, an SQRA and understand why one would do an SQRA. Let's take a look at what a potential failure mode is. A potential failure mode is defined as a unique set of conditions and or a sequence of events that could result in failure or breach. FEMA characterizes failure as the sudden rapid and uncontrolled release of impounded water or liquid borne solids. According to FEMA 148, it is recognized that there are lesser degrees of failure and that any malfunction or abnormality outside the design assumptions and parameters that adversely affect a dam's primary function of impounding water is properly considered a failure. These lesser degrees of failure can progressively lead to or heighten the risk of a catastrophic failure. They are, however, normally amenable to corrective action. USACE also considers loss of service PFMs for navigation projects, which could have significant economic consequences, but no life safety risk. What is a PFMA? A potential failure mode analysis, PFMA, is a facilitated process of identifying and fully describing potential failure modes based on a diverse team's understanding of the project's vulnerabilities from a review of existing data and conditions. All dams are unique and have a specific vulnerabilities and potential failure modes. PFMA is the first and probably the most critical step in any risk analysis. Therefore, it is the blueprint for performing the risk analysis. It must be done in a diligent and thorough manner using a diverse multidiscipline team, including operations personnel who are most knowledgeable of the project and most qualified by their education and experience at the project to evaluate the structure. Some of the key concepts of a PFMA. Standards-based analysis can inform risk analysis, but be aware of limitations, assumed parameters, and simplifying assumptions of the method as well as design conservatism. Oddball PFMs often include human factors, minor geologic details, and operational problems. So be creative in your thinking. Think like detectives and coroners. Delve into the project information and question everything with a sense of discovery and fresh eyes. Technical specialists are important for risk analysis. However, with facilitation and working with diverse teams, it is important to be familiar with all aspects of risk, the hazard, the performance, and the consequences, or hazards. Remember that PFMs can and usually do involve multidisciplines like the example in the last bullet. Let's take a look at background and performance data. It's essential to compile and thoroughly review all available design documentation reports, uh, including as-built drawings, construction records, photographs, foundation reports, design memoranda, seismic studies, special investigations, inspection reports, and incident reports. Other sources of data, such as project offices, records holding, national archives, university and public libraries, may need to be investigated. 
Background data includes design, construction, geology, geometry, and any other pertinent data, while performance data includes operations, instrumentation, monitoring, and performance history, including the frequency of high pools and the record pool. Background and performance data are often discussed first because it helps get the team on the same page to understand the PFMs and prepare good descriptions. After the team has gathered, reviewed, and discussed the background and performance, the next step would be to conduct a brainstorming session of potential failure modes. During the brainstorming session, the facilitator elicits candidate PFMs from the team based on their understanding of the vulnerabilities of the project from reviewing background and performance data and their experience. These are often written on flip charts uh, with short titles or descriptions as you see here on the slide. Teams brainstorm the PFMs and then go back and evaluate each one. Common failure mechanisms are described in chapter A3 and throughout the manual. For PFMs that are not expected to contribute significantly to the risk, clearly document the reasons for excluding them from further evaluation. The team should discuss and agree on PFMs that potentially contribute the most to the risk. These are referred to as risk driver PFMs. It should not just be one person's opinion nor should the team just accept the previous failure mode screening. Let's take a look at the elements of a failure mode description. There are three main components to writing a PFM description. The initiator, the failure mechanism, and the resulting impact on the structure. You want to clearly identify and focus on the weakest link. This means that the risk for a particular PFM is estimated at the location where the risk is judged to be the greatest. If the team starts with a well-written PFM description, then they are likely to end up with a good in-depth assessment. The description can later be translated onto an event tree for a full quantitative risk analysis. Here's some examples of a failure mode uh, description. The top description is an example of a summary description that might be used as a heading, title, or as initially captured on a flip chart during the brainstorming session. It really does not describe in enough detail what the team was thinking so that someone who was not at the meeting or picking this up years later would really understand the failure mechanism. The bottom description, however, is how it would be fleshed out to include three, the three components of a good potential failure mode description. Underlining is added for emphasis. Include sketches of the potential failure mode. For internal erosion potential failure modes, it is important to clearly identify where the erosion initiates, in this case, at the unprotected exit. Include sketches to show the failure pathway or sequence. Here are some examples of adverse factors that make the PFM more likely to occur. Provide pertinent data on the loadings, conditions, defenses, and events that make this potential failure mode more likely to occur. The normal text shows how they might be captured on a flip chart and the italicized text shows how they would be written up in the report. The key factors are shown in bold text. Try to address each node in the event tree to help build the case. In most cases, the evidence will be more heavily weighted one way or the other. But keep in mind that one factor may be given much more weight than a number, than a large number of factors. Here's an example of favorable factors that make the PFM less likely to occur. Again, the normal text shows how they might be captured on a flip chart, and the italicized text shows how they would be written up in the report. There is no bold text. In this example, the key factors were shown on the previous slide and thus 
were weighted towards more likely to occur for this example. Reviewing the consequences of failure. Ideally, there will be a detailed consequence evaluation, but sometimes there is not such a study. In any case, it is important for the team to have a good understanding of the downstream conditions and to not prematurely rule out a PFM with low consequences if it has a high likelihood of occurrence. This essentially concludes the PFMA portion of the risk assessment. USACE integrates PFMA with SQRA to evaluate the significance of the PFMs. How USACE screens PFMs using SQRA is discussed in the next part of the presentation. The general risk uh, uh, matrix approach. So the estimates of likelihood of failure and associated consequences can be shown on a risk matrix, as you see here, where the greater the likelihood and the greater the consequences, the higher the risk. A risk matrix is a portrayal and communication tool to compare projects and evaluate risk tolerability. USACE uses risk estimates to categorize each project in context of portfolio and to determine most appropriate risk management actions. Risk is defined as a measure of the likelihood of and severity of consequences of an inundation associated with the presence of the flood risk management infrastructure. Incremental risk is the dam or levy risk due to failure or breach. This slide shows the basic equation for incremental risk and the correlation between SQRA and QRA. Likelihood of failure and annual probability of failure, APF, are a function of both the hazard, which is the loading, and the performance, which is the system response. This is the primary difference between SQRA and QRA. A single order of magnitude estimate is made for APF for SQRA, whereas fragility curves are developed and combined with the flood frequency to calculate APF for QRA. When the APF is multiplied by the incremental life loss given breach, we get the societal incremental life safety risk or average annual life loss, AALL. Why semi-quantitative risk analysis? SQRA uses a com combination of limited numerical estimates of hazards and performance, but no fragility curves. The result in a, an order of magnitude risk estimates. It can be a more efficient process than QRA with a primary objective of making the easy decisions on a project's risk characterization and to prioritize risk management actions and studies. It is also important to perform an initial screening for the risk driver PFMs. FERC, FERC, uses a four category system that lumps likelihood, consequences, and confidence into a single rating. USACE considers these separately, and the risk matrix approach provides more resolution on the risk. SQRA is the primary means of assessing risk in the USACE dam periodic assessment, PA program, and for levy risk assessments. SQRA is also performed at the beginning of a full QRA to reevaluate the risk characterization, to justify the need for a higher level study, and to identify the significant PFMs to be evaluated as part of the QRA. An overview of the SQRA process. So USACE integrates PFMA with SQRA to evaluate the significance of the PFMs. The general steps are summarized on this slide. After reviewing all available background and performance data diligently, a brief site visit is recommended. It is not an inspection, but rather it's a focused on vulnerabilities associated with PFMs. The team should review the loading information and consequence data described in parts B and C of the manual, respectively. After this advanced preparation, 
The team will brainstorm PFMs, which will then be categorized as risk drivers or non-risk drivers. The rationale for a PFM being a non-risk driver is documented. For each potential risk driver, the PFM is discussed and evaluated, and the risk is classified on the matrix. Lastly, recommendations for additional instrumentation and monitoring, risk reduction, data, or analysis are discussed. The first step following brainstorming is to identify those PFMs that clearly are either non-credible or are not expected to contribute significantly to the total incremental risk. An example would be failure triggered by an extreme event with low incremental consequences. The detailed reasons for excluding these from further evaluation should be clearly documented. For significant hazard potential projects, like navigation projects, evaluate at least one risk driver associated with the damming surface to categorize the dam safety risk. The risk drivers for navigation projects are usually loss of service PFMs, which only pose significant economic risk, but no life safety risk. Discuss and agree on PFMs that potentially contribute most to risk. Suggest discussing perceived greatest vulnerabilities by location. The total incremental risk for the project is generally driven by one or two PFMs. These will be the risk drivers and will help manage the number of failure modes that get carried forward for full SQRA. During the elicitation process, each team member should write down their estimate to force them to think about it and avoid bias from hearing other responses. Facilitators then collect and review the estimates. Although the first round is su submitted anonymously, after all estimates are collected and reviewed, outliers must be discussed, which means no more anonymity. One team member may have a totally different interpretation of the data or expected performance, and it is important to understand as a team why. The rest of the team may need to adjust their estimates or the outlier may have misinterpreted the data. A second round of elicitation should be conducted if necessary to arrive at a team consensus. Each risk driver PFM can be listed on a post-it note and placed on the incremental risk matrix on the wall. Different colors can help differentiate structures or elements. There are three approaches for estimating the likelihood of failure. The historical failure rate for dams is about one in 10,000 per dam year of operation. If key factors affecting the PFM are weighted towards adverse or more likely, the APF is probably greater than one in 10,000. If key factors are weighted towards favorable or less likely, the APF is probably less than one in 10,000. Chapter A3 provides qualitative descriptors for failure likelihood relative to this failure rate, which considers all dams worldwide, regardless of design and construction attention. Therefore, this method may not be appropriate for all projects. For levees, prior to overtopping PFMs can be compared to the frequency of overtopping and breach. The critical loading approach is the most common approach. For normal operating conditions, the likelihood of loading is high. However, for floods or earthquakes, the likelihood of loading could be small. Teams will estimate the loading most likely required to initiate a PFM and consider the likelihood of failure or breach given that critical loading. If the same PFM is assessed at different locations, for example, it is not necessary to fully evaluate each location. In the hybrid approach, one location is fully evaluated. The factors unique to the other location that make the APF estimate better or worse than the previous evaluation. Hence, this is the hybrid approach. Critical loading approach. In the critical loading approach, teams should first discuss the critical load level for the risk driver PFM. 
tail water can significantly affect the critical load level. For example, um, the maximum high pool may result in a lower differential hydraulic head for initiation of a PFM. And breach at the reservoir level may result in lower incremental consequence, incremental life loss due to warning and evacuation of the population at risk for uncontrolled spillway releases prior to breach. In this case, a reservoir level at the spillway crest may be more critical for differential hydraulic head and result in higher incremental life loss. It is suggested that teams start the discussion for failure likelihood with the AEP of the critical load level and then reduce that probability based on the likelihood of the step-by-step -step progression leading to failure since subsequent nodes in an event tree have probabilities less than one. Verbal probability mapping can be used for quick nodal probability estimates. If the AEP of the flood for a critical load level is virtually certain to cause failure, then the annual probability of failure is essentially, essentially equal to the AEP of that flood. Each risk driver potential failure mode can be listed on a post-it note as shown in the photo on the right and placed on a large blank incremental risk matrix on the wall. Different colors uh, can help differentiate different structures or elements, as I mentioned before. During SQRA, teams make order of magnitude estimates for both likelihood of failure and consequences for each risk driver PFM. The results are plotted on a risk matrix similar to the FN diagram used for QRA. The cells correspond to order of magnitude divisions and the PFMs are generally plotted on the matrix as boxes of the same size as the grid to represent order of magnitude estimates made by the team. The dashed red lines on the life safety risk matrix represent the tolerable risk guidelines discussed in chapter A9, which consider the incremental risk from all risk driver PFMs. A similar process can be followed for economic risk, but there is no tolerable threshold. The economic consequences shown with life loss on the x-axis are not intended to be equated to the life loss ranges to come up with a value, value for human life. The statements on the right of the matrix correspond to the order of magnitude plotting position on the vertical scale corresponding to APF and provide perspective on the likelihood of failure. The historical dam failure rate for dams is labeled an APF between one E to the minus three and one E to the minus two would correspond to a likelihood of failure that is more than 10 times higher than the average dam in the US, including all high, significant, and low hazard dams built by everyone. An essential part of the evaluation is to document any significant sources of uncertainty associated with the estimated performance or consequences. The team should also be able to discuss their confidence in the decision to take or not take action to reduce risk or reduce uncertainty associated with the risk driver PFMs based on the SQRA's risk characterization. If the confidence is low, a recommendation for additional evaluation and or investigation may be warranted to reduce the uncertainty. Lack of information is not low confidence in the decision. High uncertainty combined with low impact on the decision could result in a moderate or high confidence category because reducing the uncertainty will not change the decision. For both the assigned likelihood and consequence categories, the rationale should also address appropriateness of the performance and consequence models for the risk driver PFMs and how conditions could be better or worse than modeled. Written rationale for failure likelihood estimates should include key pieces of evidence and the APF estimate 
and key factors shown in bold should be consistent. All rationales must clearly document the team's assumptions and understandings so that a different team can review this information at the time of the next periodic assessment of risk or sooner if an incident occurs and understand what this team was thinking and whether there are changed conditions, improved knowledge, or improved state of practice that would affect the risk assessment. A couple of key questions to consider. Um, is the case adequately made for the risk estimate and risk characterization? And is the case adequately made for the recommend, recommended risk management actions? So in summary, PFMA is the first and most important step in any risk analysis. The team needs to review all background and performance data. The team should be diverse and include operations personnel. And the team must think beyond traditional analysis. PFMA, assigning likelihood and consequence categories and using a risk matrix, provide a, re a relevant risk categorization system. A risk matri matrix approach to conduct SQRA is a useful and quick means to prioritize dam levy safety program activities, especially to determine if higher level studies would be beneficial. And that concludes the presentation for PFMA and SQRA chapters A3 and A4.